Well, good evening. And I've got a little ring here, so let me turn this down just a minute. Let me back up here just a second. Let's try this. Hopefully this will work. So I had a little bit of ring in our sound system, but we'll get it adjusted here. Uh, we do have our service tonight uh, also on the radio, so those uh, who are listening that are close by to us here that can hear it on the radio, uh, we're, we welcome them. Uh, but it's good having you here, and I'm glad that you joined us. And, and I, before we get started tonight, I just want to appreciate and tell you how much I, I thank you so much for your faithfulness and watching our services. You know, this is a difficult time. We've been doing this, I think, now probably six weeks uh, maybe seven weeks now. Uh, but anyway, I know it's difficult when you're home. Uh, it's hard to continue to be faithful. There's so many other distractions that go on. And I just want to commend you for your faithfulness. Uh, some of you aren't able to watch the services live uh, through Facebook, but you are able to pick them up on YouTube. And I appreciate that as well. So uh, we're going to start off here with a couple songs. And if you know the songs, you sing along with me if you want to. And uh, if not, then you just listen to me as I sing, and then I'm going to bring uh, a challenge here from God's Word. Um, do 389 first. I am resolved. <clears throat> do, uh, uh, do four verses. <laughs> Faithful 
to be steadfast and unmovable in this day and time in which we live. And Lord, I'm asking and praying that you will uh, help us to stand strong and true, that Lord, we will have a testimony that our light will shine so bright that Lord, others might see it and they might hunger and thirst after righteousness. Lord, I pray also that you might put the words in our mouth that we might be a verbal witness for you as well. Lord, we might invite others to watch our services. We could uh, share uh, these services on the social networks that we have so our other friends may be able to see them, that, that maybe they wouldn't normally uh, have that opportunity. Lord, I'm praying and asking that you will bless us tonight in our service. May the singing uh, prepare us for the preaching. And then, Lord, challenge us, Lord, as only you can from the Word of God. And, and Lord, our desire is always, if there's anyone that might be listening that does not know Jesus as their Savior, Lord, I'm praying that this will be the day they get it settled. Lord, maybe there's a Christian that's watching who uh, has been struggling and is just away from you. And maybe they've drifted just a little bit. Lord, I'm praying that tonight would be the night that they just purpose in their heart, Lord. That they're going to follow thee. They're going to come back to you with all their heart. And, and not just come part way, Lord, but they're going to come all the way. Father, we ask and pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Victory in Jesus. <clears throat>
blood. Well, I thank you, Elizabeth, for playing again for us here tonight. And if you would take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 1 John, chapter number 2. 1 John is a great book. It's probably one of the best books. If you're going to start reading your Bible, this is a great place to start uh, in the New Testament. This is an easy book to understand. And there's a lot of characteristics we find in uh, this epistle of John. <clears throat> we find something called the birthmarks of a believer. There's a lot of evidences that uh, John has here in the scriptures uh, about proofs that you're saved. Now, before I get into the message, I do want to tell you uh, what we're doing for our services uh, coming up here in the next uh, few weeks. Uh, as of right now, Mother's Day, we are still going to do our drive-in service for Sunday morning. Uh, we do have a gift uh, for uh, the mothers that will be here for the drive-in service. We'll have uh, something. I don't know when we're going to be able to meet again in the building. I'm working on that right now. I've uh, been working on that, trying to get that taken care of. There's a few things that have to be done beforehand. And uh, anyway, uh, we will continue doing our services the way we've been doing it. Driving service Sunday morning at 11, and then Sunday night uh, back in here doing it live, and then Wednesday night like we are right now. That is the plan for next week. Now, uh, if I can change that, if there's anything that changes and we are able to meet, there are some criteria that we have to, to be able to meet these criteria before we can meet. Uh, right now, the only way I think we can do this would be to have uh, maybe, and this is, this is just something I'm throwing out there right now, uh, for Sunday morning, maybe having a nine o'clock service here in the auditorium for only those who are 65 years and older. Now, if you're on the borderline and you're 64 and your wife's 66 and you wanna come, that's fine. Uh, but this would be so we could spread out like they're asking that we spread out. Uh, I do ask that if we start doing these services, which eventually we're gonna be coming back uh, to normal, but if you come to that service, uh, or any of our services, please do not come if you're sick or you're not feeling well uh, because, again, they've asked that this be one of the criteria. So just, you, just using common sense. Uh, but what I'm thinking is maybe uh, if we can do it the Sunday after Mother's Day, that would be great. It might be the next service, uh, the next Sunday after that, but I'll, I'll let you know. Um, but 9 o'clock, maybe a service here for those 65 and older. And then at 11 o'clock, instead of our driving service, uh, to have it in the activity building. Now, uh, with that, everyone that comes will need to have a mask. If you have a mask already, please bring it. Uh, we will have a mask here with you. I know some people don't like that, and I'm one of them. I would have to preach with a mask on. Uh, but again... Uh, this is just a day and time. I wouldn't let that keep you from coming to church. Uh, you know, if that keeps you from coming to church, that's not, that's kind of a petty little thing to keep you from coming to church. It might be a little uncomfortable. I know it will be for me. Uh, and I know sometimes those things get hot underneath. Now, if you have breathing issues and a mask just isn't going to work for you, that's a different story. But anyway, that's kind of what we're going to do, maybe. Uh, that's what we're shooting for. We will also, uh, I'll be doing the service, uh, even though I won't be doing it live, I'll probably be doing uh, the 9 o'clock service, recording it, and then I'll post it after our 11 o'clock service. I'll post it to Facebook and YouTube. Uh, but the Sunday morning service just won't be live at that time because we can't get internet into our activity building. Um, but that's the plan for now. Uh, I don't think we're going to meet Sunday night and Wednesday night yet. Uh, We'll just have to see how it goes. Uh, we're going to ease into this thing. Uh, we don't want to rush into it too uh, quickly, but we would like to meet together. I know some of you would like to get back here to church. Uh, others, uh, I'm looking forward to it, looking forward to having some folks uh, to preach to. I'm glad Josh comes occasionally. He gets to sit here while I preach to him. We've had a few others. Jody was here a time or two. Rodney have been here a time or two. and, and uh, and if you come and sing a special, you're welcome to stay, obviously, uh, for the service. But anyway, that's kind of what's going on. I haven't completed everything yet, so right now we're just going to continue as we are. 
until you hear something different. But 1 John chapter 2, and we'll begin reading in verse number 1. It says, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. Now I want to zero in on that phrase there we find in verse number 6. This is a great little passage here. But it says, He that saith he abideth in him, and this little phrase, ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. I want to preach a message entitled To Be Like Jesus. This is our goal as a Christian. To be like Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to bless us now. May you speak to us as we have here a few minutes together. I pray, Lord, you help us to consider this, Lord, because this world needs to see a lot of little Christ. And Lord, we need to, we have just a short time here, whether we have 20 years, 40 years, 60 years, or 100 years on this earth. Our time is very short compared to eternity. Lord, I thank you for the faithful saints of God that we've had that's been watching our services and continue to watch. And, and uh, Lord, I'm thankful for that. And I pray that you will help us to be more like Jesus. Even, Lord, as we are uh, apart from each other physically, but we're together in spirit, help us to be like our wonderful Savior. We ask and pray these things now in Christ's name. Amen. Now, I did want to mention also to you, if you are watching... Uh, I forgot to mention this the last few weeks, but uh, something that is encouraging for people to see is as you scroll down, if you're watching on Facebook, if you can put in the comments, uh, you know, how many is watching your group, you can just put a number in there, uh, because it might just show one person there watching, but there might be five of you, or there might be 12 of you, or there might be two of you, or one of you. Uh, if you would, if you haven't done that already, just put in the comments, how many people are watching. I don't know. You might be able to do that on YouTube also. I don't know. Uh, it's not something that uh, we're tracking or we're not tracking attendance or anything, but it's just encouraging to see how many folks are uh, tuning in. So I appreciate you doing that. But to be like Jesus, that is our goal as a Christian. You know, when God saved you, and if you're saved today, you ought to say amen to that. Because if, when God saved you, that was not the end-all, be-all of everything. He did not die on that old rugged cross. He did not live a sinless life on this earth for three and a half years. And uh, he did not do all these things. He did not leave the splinters of heaven and then arise from the dead the third day and ascend up to the Father. He did not do all of these things just to save you. He did these things to save you and then... So you can be like him and we can see other people get saved. You see, this thing is to continue to multiply. If we do not become like Jesus, guess what happens? If we do not become like him, then it stops with us. We don't multiply ourselves. We don't make disciples of all nations like God tells us to do. And I'm praying in my own heart that God will help me to be a strong witness for him until he calls me home. As we look in this passage, 1 John chapter 2, there's a few things I would like to point out to you. First of all, in verse 1, it says, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. Now, that little phrase there, that ye sin not, this is talking about you ought not be comfortable in your sin. Now, we know we're going to sin. We struggle in this body of flesh. But when you start making excuses for your sin, you're in a dangerous place. You're in a very dangerous place. That's what it says, that you sin not. You ought not be comfortable 
in your sin. You ought, when you realize that you have sinned, you ought to get away from it just as quickly as you possibly can. Now, I know sin can get a hold of you. I've been there. Sin can get a hold of you. But you ought to fight with all of your being and all of your power and go and flee to the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the one who will empower you to turn from your sin. That's what that little phrase means. And then it goes on here in verse 2. It says, And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. That's a lawyer. Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus becomes our lawyer. If we stumble into sin or we make a wrong choice somewhere, we have a lawyer. Jesus Christ is pleading our case to God the Father. Aren't you thankful for that? But verse 2 says, and he is the propitiation for our sin. Now that's a big word. We don't use that. I don't know anybody ever uses that other than preachers and maybe Bible school teachers. But that word propitiation just simply means this. It was something to appease the wrath of God. That's what propitiation means. When Jesus Christ shed his blood on that cross, it appeased the wrath of God. You see, God's wrath is on us. Why? Because of our sin. Don't think that God is going to play games with sin. He does not do that. He judges sin and he will judge it harshly. He will judge it so much that he will have to sin those who reject the free gift of salvation through his son by accepting the, the death, burial, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, he is going to have to send them to a lake of fire for all eternity. That's not good news. Because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus Christ was the propitiation for our sins. And it says, and not for ours only, not only for Christians, but for the whole world. Now, those who might be listening who have a Calvinistic viewpoint that think that only it was Christians who Jesus Christ was the propitiation for, that verse right there clearly dispels that. And then in verses 3 through 5, there's something that John talks about here called abiding. Now, we're going to look at that in just a moment. And then I'm going to give you some quick things of how we ought to be like Jesus. Uh, so we need to kind of lay some groundwork here. Verses 3 through 5 says... And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now that's called obedience right there. Verse 4 says, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. You're a hypocrite. And the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. That means you're going to continue to grow. The love of God is going to develop fully in your life. Hereby know we that we are in him. So verses 3 through 5 is talking about uh, this thing about abiding. We're going to see it again in verse 6. But how can you know? Let me ask you a question. How can you know that you are really saved? How can you know you're really saved? We find the answer there in verses 3, 4, and 5. It's only by obeying Him. That's how you can know you're saved. For you to say that you are saved and you are clearly living in sin and it doesn't bother you. Does, you just don't care. You're going to do it anyway. There's a problem. There's a problem in your heart. I can't see your heart. But God does and his word will expose what's going on in your life. And he clearly says there, obedience is the key. If you truly are saved, and Jesus said it this way, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's obedience. Now, do we obey all the time? No, we don't do it. Many times we are disobedient and even we sin when we know we ought to be doing something and we don't do it. Maybe you know you ought to be talking to your loved one about the Lord Jesus Christ and you ought to witness to him and you don't do it. That's disobedience. That's sin. We sin in a lot of different ways. But when we have that strong desire to obey him, we're not going to obey him all the time. But we ought not use that for an excuse. You ought to strive to obey him all the time. And here's how we can do it. Verse 6 says, He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. So the key here to being obedient, proving to ourselves that we're saved, is abiding 
in him. Now that's important. Because some would say that we are to imitate Christ. Well, you know, I can get up here and imitate certain people. And really all I'm doing is just temporarily trying to be like that person. That's not what this is talking about. Abiding means you actually, uh, it's a whole different mindset. You actually become a part of the same source. Matter of fact, uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So we are to be conformed. We are to be poured into the image of Jesus Christ. We are to take the same form as Jesus. Back in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, John talks again in more detail about this matter of abiding. John 15, verse 1 says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. You see what John's saying there in verse 4 is, when we abide in Jesus Christ, if we are going to be like Jesus, and we're going to abide in him so we can obey him, then there's going to be purpose for your life. You know, there's a lot of people living on this earth today, and they're, they're wandering around with no clear purpose for their life. A lot of people like that. God wants you to have purpose because he created you for a purpose. He created me for a purpose. And that's what verse 4 is saying. That abiding in him is so we can bear fruit because without him, we can do nothing. If we don't abide in him, then we're nothing. But when we abide in him, we now have purpose. But look at what abiding does in verse 5. It says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. He's talking here about our production. Our producing more fruit. More people that are going to get saved and be discipled and become like Jesus. And then in verse 7, as let me read verse 6 and then get down to verse 7. It says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. When we abide in Christ, we also have praying power. You ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. That's abiding in Christ. It gives us purpose. It helps us to produce in the Christian life. It gives us praying power. And then as we read on here, it says, Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments. Now there's that thought of obedience again. Ye shall abide in my love. You see, obedience and abiding are tied together. Ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. You know what that means? When we abide in Jesus Christ, that gives us placement. We are placed in his hands. We are going to abide in his love, just like he is abiding in the Father's love. We have purpose. We have production in the Christian life. We have praying power. And we also have placement. But verse 11 gives us pleasure. This is real pleasure. This is pleasure that will last. This is not adrenaline type pleasure that's going to come and go and then you have to have another high. This is real pleasure. Verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you. The abiding. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Your joy might be full. So if we say that we are saved and we're abiding in Christ, then, as it says back in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, then we ought to walk as Jesus walked. We ought to be like him. 
Now, let me give you some ways. These are not, there are so many different characteristics of Jesus, we don't have time to get into all, but there's just a few I was thinking of. And I think these are good for us to work on. These are some that I had to work on in my own life. And I want to challenge you to work on these in your life. And I don't have time to spend on all of these. I'm just going to give you a few here. First of all, he, if you're going to be like Jesus, he is unselfish. Unselfish. You know we're selfish by nature. The Bible says he gave his life a ransom for many. He gave his life a ransom for many. Most people are interested today in learning how to love themselves. You never would have thought, I never would have thought that would have ever had to be taught. How to love yourself. But that's what people are teaching today. How to love yourself. You know what? This is what the Bible says. This is Ephesians chapter 5 verse 29. For no man, now this is from God and God knows us. He created us. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh. But nourish, nourish it and cherish it. That means he loves it. He loves himself, even as the Lord, the church. But what did Christ do for the church? He gave himself for it. What do we do for ourselves? We give ourselves for ourselves, don't we? We tend to be selfish. But if we're going to be like Jesus, we need to be unselfish. We need to think of others. He gave his life a ransom for many. You know, Christ gives us strength when we're weak. He gives us grace when we're weak. The Bible says, wherefore he giveth more grace. That's uh, the ability and strength to do his will. He gives us peace that passes all understanding. He gives us joy. He gives us so many things. Why? Because he's unselfish. He's also gentle. If you're going to be like Christ, you ought to be gentle. You ought to be a gentle individual. Psalm 18, verse 35 says, this is the end of the verse. It says, thy gentleness hath made me great. You know, gentleness is also part of the fruit of the Spirit. To be gentle simply means to be kind and tender. In other words, you're not harsh. You're not rough. Some fathers are... That way with their kids, you say, well, I'm just trying to toughen them up. You ought to be gentle. It's okay to, to horse around with your kids and, and toughen them up a little bit. But they ought to know the gentleness of a father, just like we know the gentleness of our Heavenly Father. If we're going to be like Christ, we ought to be gentle. Gentleness is being kind. You know, in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, it talks about charity. Charity is the agape love. It says it is kind. That's gentleness. If we're going to be like Christ, Christ was also merciful. Now some of us have to work on this because we're not very merciful. Mercy is when you don't give somebody something that they deserve. They deserve. We deserve God's wrath. That's what we deserve. But God, in his mercy, does not want to give us his wrath. He wants to give us eternal life. Isn't that wonderful? That's mercy. He is merciful. And you know, when we think about the mercies of God, we, don't, we aren't merciful towards an individual one time, and then they mess up tomorrow, and we're like, well, I was merciful towards him yesterday. That's not the way Christ is. His mercies are renewed every morning. His compassions fail not. This is our wonderful Savior. And if we're going to be like Him, we must abide in Him. We, and if we're going to say we abide in Him and obey Him, we ought to walk as He walked. You know, the Lord is also truthful. If we're going to be like Him, we ought to be truthful. Some of us, and I'm one that can... Uh, I struggled with this years ago. But some of us can tend to be deceitful. You say one thing, do something else. Or you try to give enough truth to where you... I used to do this with my parents when I was younger. And if they're watching tonight, uh, they might remember some of these things. But I would, tell them, I would tell them enough truth to get them to think what I wanted them to think. But really I was doing something else. You know, sometimes kids are that way. 
That's not truthful. And that's not like Jesus. Jesus was truthful. There was no deceit in him at all. The Bible says that his word, now Jesus is the living word, but his word is also true. He is truthful. He is merciful. He's unselfish. And he is gentle. Let me give you another one. These are some things that we can work on if we're going to be like Jesus. He is patient. He is patient. You know, God gives us more opportunities than we deserve. As we look back over our life, I think of the many opportunities God gave me. But you know what? Don't push the boundaries. Because you may think you have another opportunity coming, but you may be on your last chance. We don't know how many chances each one of us has. I know of some young people who, uh, they were good young people from good homes. And I know several different circumstances. One, uh, same, they were from the same type of backgrounds, same type of home. One of them, one of this type of young people experimented in drugs. Ran, ran out of church, away from God for a period of time, several years, did their own thing. God got a hold of their heart, came back to the Lord. Another individual, one time, dabbled in alcohol, died in a car wreck that night. One time. Don't play games with God. He's patient. He gives us many opportunities, but we don't know when we're on the last one, the last chance. He is patient. We ought to be patient with other people. Sometimes our nerves get a little short. I know my, uh, my nerves get a little afraid when I deal with uh, idiots, you know, people who ought to know better, who have no common sense. And uh, my patience wears a little thin with people like that. But you know what? If I'm going to be like Jesus, guess what I need to do? Still have patience. And you know, Jesus is also long-suffering. Now, patience and long-suffering are similar, but they're not quite the same. To be long-suffering means you allow yourself to be wronged. It's very similar to patience, but to be long-suffering means you are willing to allow someone else to wrong you. And then you take it patiently. That's how they're tied together. But Jesus was long-suffering. You know, every time we sin, it's just like Jesus Christ is being crucified fresh and new. You need to stop and think about what your sin did to Christ. I need to stop and think about what my sin did to Christ. He's long-suffering. He's patient. He's merciful. He's gentle. He's a good God. And I want to leave you with just one more. We don't have time to get into all of them. Let me just give you one last one here as we close. If we're going to be like Jesus, Jesus is also forgiving. He's forgiving. Jesus is always going to forgive those who are truly repentant. Those who in their heart. They may be bound by sin, but in their heart they're crying out to God and saying, God, please forgive me. I don't want to do this anymore. And they mean it. They may struggle with it. They may be addicted to it. But in their heart they're crying out to God and they're repenting from it in their heart. I'm going to tell you, God will give you victory in your life eventually. Some people he gives it immediately. Some people it takes a little bit of time. But God, if you keep crying out to God, God is forgiven. He's long-suffering. I'm so thankful 1 John 1, 9 is in the Bible. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, to confess your sins means you agree with God. God, this was a wicked, vile thing that I did. You don't sugarcoat it and say, well, I know I did wrong. I shouldn't have done that. That's not confessing your sin. Confessing your sin is, God, I committed a great abomination against you, and I did wickedly. I'm agreeing with what your word says about my sin. That's confession. The Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Aren't you thankful? Thankful for that. He is forgiven to us. But you know what? Because he is forgiven to us, we, if we're going to be like Jesus, we ought to be forgiving to one another. Have you ever had somebody wrong you? Have you ever had somebody say something to hurt your feelings? Have you ever had somebody maybe forget something that you thought was important, but to them it maybe didn't seem so important and it kind of hurt you a little bit? We've all been hurt. But you know what a lot of us do? We carry those hurts around with us. And we never give them to Jesus. The Bible says, For consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. That means when we think about the hurt others have done to us, we need to stop and say, now wait a minute. Is that anything compared to the hurt that I've caused to Christ? I need to consider him. And then we realize very quickly it's not. That thing they said about me, that thing they did to me, that's nothing compared to what I did to Christ. So if he forgave me, I ought to also be willing to forgive them. I want to leave you with two verses here from 1 John. 1 John chapter number 4. There's a lot of things I could say about forgiveness. But I'm thankful he is always ready to forgive us. Why? Because his mercy is great. He's patient. He's long-suffering. He's kind. He's gentle. He's all these things that we've looked at. He's unselfish. But if we're going to be like Jesus, 1 John chapter 4, listen to what it says here, these last two verses of chapter 4. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, not a suggestion, it's a commandment, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Remember what Jesus said about loving your enemies? Yep. We ought to love our brothers, love our sisters. We ought to love our enemies. If we're going to love God and we're going to be like Jesus, we need to be forgiving, we need to be loving, we need to be unselfish. We need to be patient, kind, all these traits that Christ had. We need to strive to be more like him. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll close our service. Father, we thank you again for your blessings and I pray that you will help us, Lord, to be more like Jesus. Lord, I don't know what the needs are in the hearts of those who are listening right now, but, but Lord, we're thankful. Oh, Lord, we're so thankful for your word. Lord, I'm even thankful for the situation that we have in our country right now, even though I would love, love to be, have the folks back here in church, be back to normal. But Lord, we know there's a plan and purpose for it, and we're going to give you thanks for all things, because Lord, there is a great plan and purpose in it all. But Lord, I'm asking and praying that you help us to be like Christ. And if there's one that's listening right now, Lord, who is struggling with their sin. Lord, they, if they were to die this minute, they really are not confident, 100%, that they would go to heaven. Lord, I'm asking, Lord, that you would speak to that heart right now so that they know it. Point it out to them very clearly. Make it plain to them that they need to trust you as their Savior right now. They need to accept the free gift of salvation. Lord, I thank you for paying the price for our sin. But Lord, those of us who are saved, we have a great job to do. Because you didn't just save us to take us to heaven. You saved us so we could be like Jesus. And we must abide in him. And to abide in him is to obey him. Help us, Lord, especially in the areas where we fail and we struggle. We ask and pray these things now in Christ's name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for watching. And I hope you have a great rest of your week.